Hey everyone, welcome to the Oasis Podcast. I'm your host, Miss AJ. Thanks for tuning in. An oasis is something that provides refuge, relief, or pleasant contrast, and that is exactly what you can find tuning into the Oasis Podcast. This will be a space where I and special guests will be cultivating intentional and honest conversations about life's journey. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe now. Also follow us on Instagram at the Oasis Podcast. That's T-H-E-O-A-S-I-S Podcast. Welcome everyone to the Oasis Podcast. And I'm joined today by my lovely hey, guest, boo. Hey, boo. Miss Ayana. Hey, y'all. Okay, out here Cheers. slaying. Cheers to the Oasis. Slaying out here. Okay. Podcast. <laughs> I wasn't First ready. Video. I wasn't ready. But today we will be talking about a topic. By the time you guys see this recording and hear this episode, uh, I would have already dropped my episode about my fertility journey. And Miss Ayana and I have been talking about tons of things. Fertility has been one of them. And I felt you were a great person to have this conversation Thank with you. because you've had your experiences, you know, with fertility and going into the journey that you decided to go on. And we'll talk about that a Absolutely. little bit later. So a brief little overview of okay. what you've experienced. And I can kind of touch on kind of what I've been going through. <laughs> Absolutely. So this is a very personal conversation. I think any woman, you know, who hopes to be a parent, hopes to be a mother, whether they have great success and and ease with fertility or whether there are challenges, it's just a very personal topic. So for me, I've always wanted to be a mom. Um, I I will be a mother and uh, fertility hasn't been easy for me. I don't have any biological children um, and I've experienced uh, infertility and miscarriages. And so it's it's been a road been a test of faith and a test of patience and a test of will um but you know i know that god is going to bless me in in his divine timing and in his plan so i'm glad to talk about this today and and share my story thank you and you're absolutely right this is a sensitive topic and yeah and i wonder why exactly that is for other people why it's so like taboo yeah to talk about like fertility. why that is and i and I was actually thinking about this earlier. Is it because fertility is like with sex and people are comfortable mm. talking about sex? Or is it because of kind of the norms or these um, ideals that society throws out there about you being a woman and yeah. that you're supposed to be your capacity right. or what you're supposed to do. This is what you would put on this earth to do. So I don't know which one of it it is. I know for me it's not about the sex part because I don't mind talking about sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess for me it's, It's not uncomfortable, exactly. It's just that, I guess for me, why the conversation hasn't happened with other people is it's just never brought up. Right. And I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's the taboo of sex. And then I think it's the, yes, definitely what society places on women and places on their bodies and the way that society polices women. Um, You should be able to, if something is wrong with you, you're broken. You're not a woman if you don't do X, Y, and Z. So yeah. they make it um, really extremely taboo to just talk about it. And other women don't talk about it with other women. Uh, it's kind of like a silent battle we go through and, and, until we find a village or people that we can be that vulnerable with. It's very sensitive. It's a very sensitive topic. I think even medical professionals don't really go there and talk about it unless you're going yeah. specifically for infertility issues. Your primary care doctor is not going to talk about That's it. That's true. No, you're absolutely... Because I'm thinking about that. I have a black woman, a PCP. I love her. I love her. I love her. Been with her for years. And I was the one who brought up the conversation. It was never of like, hey, you know, have right. you thought about... At a certain age. Right. You should be nothing. talking... Nothing. To- I brought it up. Right. And she was like, oh, okay, sure, we can run such and such. And it's like, why is this not a conversation that's brought up? When you right. know your patient is of childbearing years. But maybe right. getting up there. Because as you do get older, it gets more difficult. Yes, so it maybe does. it's just one of those... Are you thinking about having children? Right. And then from there, the conversation could be guided one way or the other. They don't even bring it up. They do not bring yeah. it up. They even don't. in the medical field. So it's like this, it's so taboo. Um, society tells you that you should be doing this by this time and you should have this by that time and this and that and, and sets all these expectations on you. And then your own family, mm. like that generational Girl. 
curse about not talking about this stuff because I don't even know. Like I'm a daughter of a mother and a mother and a mother of a mother and a mother, and I don't know their struggles with fertility. I don't know what they went through to have the children that they have. It's just not talked about. That's very true. That you know what? Now that you just said that makes me go. I think I'm gonna have a conversation with my mother. But you're absolutely right. It's not talked about. It's always like you need to have kids. At least in my family, mm-hmm. it's oh you gotta have kids. You got mm-hmm. you got to leave what something you waiting on, this on. What, what you, you waiting, waiting for? Ex- that's it. But it's never to <laughs> talk about. Have you tried? What's going on with you reproductively? Right. It, it, they, yeah, that's really not a conversation. Yeah, and I think isn't that crazy? We don't we don't talk about our vaginas with our mothers. Isn't right. that crazy? Like come on, like we the, came the, out the, our vaginas. The women we came right. from, we don't even have that conversation. Yeah, it's and and I think it makes. Okay. And this is why I think it's not brought up, at least for me and my experience, only time fertility was brought up is when the woman that I was speaking to had an issue. Like, so mm. it was like a very, it was a thing they couldn't hide, if Got that you. makes sense. So Got like, you. I know people who've been pregnant and they and they lose the child in long right. term, right? right? And so that's a conversation that's like, whoa, because everyone saw that you were pregnant right. and then there was no baby, right? And so there's like, that's how the that conversation, the conversation yeah, right. is brought up. Um, even miscarriages, depending on what stage, some people don't even talk about mm-hmm. it. And so people suffer silently. And I think to me as, as a woman, so we can talk as a woman, we know that, you know, studies have shown and all the, the statistics show the more educated you are, right? The, the less likely or that you are to have children, mm-hmm. essentially, is mm-hmm. what they say. Um, That's what they say. And for black women, right, like, even for us, we are, we become, we, we are probably one of the highest, highest educated groups yes. of women. Shout so, out to black women. Okay, all right, get it. <laughs> and so, for, so that right there, if you're connecting the dots based on what statistics are saying, that means if we're taking longer to get our lives together, to right. get our education together, to get our careers together. And the coin. And the coin. Right. Don't forget the bag. Right. So that means essentially we're having children later. later. Later in life. Absolutely. But then why the conversation is not occurring? Because uh, it shouldn't be taboo. It shouldn't studies be. Studies show you, statistics so show you. Pretty much fertility starts to decline. It starts to decline in your late 20s, but drastically right. after 35. Yes. And yes. a lot of us are getting it together about that stage, right? We right. I'm got two years point. away. I'm, I'm closer to 35 than I'm... I'm than closer I, to 35 than you are. Um, so, <laughs> and like, by the time... we. By the time we hit that age is when we're like, all right. I'm know, ready. I'm feeling, right now I'm ready. I'm right. feeling kind of good. But right. then if you're now going into the doctor and you're now trying to try, more than likely we're not even going to the doctor. We're just trying to find a partner right. to try. Right. And so we're going to be trying and trying. Years are going to roll down. Now we're going to be touching 40. Right. And that's when we probably that's show really up to the doctor. That's really at high risk, right. And that's when right. the problems occur. That's right. when they're like, oh, your egg reserves. Oh, your, your mm-hmm. uterus is this. And now you're spending a, at least six months a year trying to fix the mm-hmm. things to see if you can even Instead and it's of like family planning in your mid 20s why is that not a part even your gynecological visit right it's not a part of it they don't even have the not a part of it in my 20s nobody ever asked me when i went to the the obgyn are you starting a family they would ask you know about your sexual history and partners and mm-hmm. and all of that and and but nobody asked are you you know starting a family are you planning to start a family you're at this age you're at this stage this is when you should be thinking about it are you never a conversation Listen, never let me tell you the conversation i had when i went to gyn it was this white doctor i was it was recommended to me i was gyn hopping shopping rather mm-hmm. and i was at this point maybe mid-20s okay i already obtained my i had a i had my master's at this point so i was educated working figuring it out and this white male doctor, so I, he asked me, I was in a relationship at the time. I was probably in a relationship about two, two years or so. And so he's like, oh, you know, are you guys family planning? Like pretty much he's, he, his line of question was like using protection and such. I'm like, no, right. I've been with my partner. We've been tested. This is right. what we do, et cetera. And he was like, oh, you should wait till you're married. Like you shouldn't oh. do it. Girl. Oh. <laughs> No, like I asked you that. Like I asked you what you. I didn't. I I didn't ask your opinion. Right. That was one. Uh, Two is I'm fully capable uh, and I have the knowledge. I have the education. I used to teach reproductive health. I have. Right. I have all this knowledge. So I understand what comes into it. And, he, and for him, and I'm. And it's not like I'm some young kid. And even right. still, you should not. Who, who are you? Should you impose to right. say that to somebody? And that's what he said to me. <laughs> that was the first and last time I seen him. But that was the only conversation that when I went to GYN about family planning. You right. know what I mean? Unless I went. 
into the visit saying, hey, right, this is what should I, I this is what I'm thinking, should I be concerned? That's a mouthful about Ooh. how oppressive the um, medical field mm. is. And I just, I mean, I, I'm preaching to the choir because black folks know how oppressive the medical field is. But me being black, mm. me being woman, me being of a certain size and stature in my body, fat, um, the medical field never... Uh, greeted me with care and never never greeted me with warmth um every time I showed up whatever ailment whatever illness I felt whatever if I had a common cold it was you know you're too fat you need to lose weight so you don't get a cold I'm like oh yeah girl oh yeah like that that's off topic but yeah the medical field has been talk about that not in this episode right right has been incredibly oppressive and then when it comes to reproduction it's it's it was the same thing um I was with um, an ex of mine, my last ex. We were together for almost seven years, and he had a child. I had no children, and I wanted to have a child, and we were not using protection. We were doing what we was doing, and we weren't getting pregnant. And so they say if, a, if somebody is trying and actively not using protection, mm-hmm. and after a year you don't get pregnant, then there is some fertility yep. issues mm-hmm. there. And we then, at one point, got pregnant. This was in 2013. Um, Around the end of March, beginning of April, got pregnant. Peed on the stick. Oh, I'm pregnant. So then it was all the nerves and stuff and, like, early pregnancy. First of all, once you you know you're pregnant, when you pee on the stick and it say, yes, girl, them symptoms come Really? Fast and furious, child. Mind over matter. Uh, what? It's all in the mind. Yeah. Child, I, I couldn't stay awake. I was like falling asleep on people on the train. I was like drooling on myself. My titties <laughs> hurt. The symptoms came fast yeah. and furious. But, you know, it was excitement. It was excitement. It was nerves. I was about 2013. I may have been like 25 around mm. then. Mm. And we lived together. And I was like, this is what I want. I want to be a mother. So, okay, this is what's happening. And then I had a miscarriage uh, May 5th of that oh. year, Cinco de Mayo. And um, the process, at the time I was uh, in between jobs, just starting a job, mm-hmm. and my insurance had not yet kicked in. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how oppressive the healthcare system is for the uninsured. That was just something I just shot up praise to, to right. because a praise to God about because not having insurance, can you imagine going through this process? I can. That is a blessing it. to have it. Just to have it. Yeah, just whatever have it. it is. I don't they care. They treat you differently. If it's Medicaid, Medicaid, whatever. They treat it you is. differently if you're yeah. uninsured. Can we talk about that? Girl, so I went know. downtown. Anybody from Brooklyn knows Willoughby. Mm. Downtown mm. to 81 Willoughby, the chop shop. Everybody know Planned Parenthood. To pay out of pocket for some services because I didn't yet have insurance with the new job that I was getting. And when I tell you just the treatment of going into that clinic, they treated me like shit. Mm. Um, when you're early in the pregnancy, they take blood work and they're testing some hormones to see that your hormones are wrapped rac- rapidly increasing and my hormones were not increasing and they were like well it could be a miscarriage it could be a topic pregnancy it could be something else but you got to pay us up front $190 for this test we're not going to do nothing to you give us the cash you got cash on you right now like that's how this lady was talking to me I'm there with tears in my eyes like I just wow. really want to know what's going on Super with my body expensive. and my baby like yeah. you get your money like here's my bank card sis like you get your bread, but could you? Do you have any sensitivity to somebody that doesn't know what's happening to their body and to their child? And uh, I sat in Brooklyn Hospital for about twelve hours and waited in in, in the emergency room to see what was going on. Just make make you sit there and wait. I went back to the chop shop, pay them the one ninety, did the test, and they were like, "Well, we gonna send you home. You gotta wait for the results and come back when we have the results." And uh, this was over the span of like four days that I was like threatening a miscarriage. It was a threatening of a miscarriage. And then Sunday, May 5th, I woke up. I had cramps. I got in the shower. There was blood. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the hospital. Um, And I went to Methodist. And that is where I actually had my miscarriage. And that experience was traumatic as hell sitting in, in the hospital going through that, going through that by myself. Um, uh, yeah, we're gonna talk. We're gonna, okay, because I'm about to. We're going to. I tell all my tea. It's my tea. I mm-hmm. spill it. I'll pour it. So I, my partner was um, 
a jerk, not very sensitive, and in his own thing and in his own bag. And he drove me. I woke him up that Sunday, tapped him, hey, I need to go to the, the emergency room. And we were beefing. We weren't even speaking then. Mm. We were fighting about something else. And so he got up with an attitude and was like, all right, fine, let me take you. Got in my mother's truck, went to Methodist, and we get to the door of the emergency room. And he's like, do you want me to come in with you? What you think? Right. Which I thought I said. Which I thought. <laughs> like, so I look. I put my shades on. I say, you do what you got to do. And I got out the car and I just went in the emergency room. Because I had no time to deal with his attitude and whatever wow. my body was going through. And I sat in the emergency room by myself uh, for quite a bit of time. Quite a bit of hours. And at first I was in the waiting area of the emergency room. And they took you back to triage. And then they put me in a hallway in a chair. Uh, not in the bed, just sitting in a chair, and I'm actively bleeding on mm. myself, actively releasing my child, and you know I'm sitting there. Of course, I'm emotional. Anybody who's ever experienced uh, miscarriage, some people just go through it. It's quick. Some people it goes through it, and it's very long time. I'm sitting there, boohooing, crying. People are passing by me as if I'm invisible. Nobody stops and says, "Are you okay? Oh what goodness. do you need? Do you need a tissue? Do you need a hug?" Nobody said anything to me while I sat in the waiting area bleeding. And then um, there were lots of exams because they had to give me an ultrasound, a sonogram, blood work, and make sure that I passed everything and that everything Mm. took its course. And um, I can just tell any woman knows how uh, invasive (laughs) sonograms are. Now imagine a sonogram in the middle of a miscarriage so it was it was a mess there was blood everywhere i'm apologizing to the sonogram tech i'm like i'm so sorry i'm getting blood on your floor he's looking at me like what is wrong with you like you're having a miscarriage lady you're gonna bleed and uh it was kind of out of body it was out of body out of mind i was detached from the experience because it was traumatic yeah um and then they gave my discharge papers and sent me home and that was it and then i left my child and i left that in that space my heart and went home and um, had to, like, you know, pick up the pieces and deal with the all of the letdown. Um, the plans that you make in your mind, I don't know for anybody else, but when you pee on that stick and it's a yes, you immediately go into planning a life for this child, planning your life around becoming a parent, and then that just is snatched away. So that was that was my story. That's my testimony of my miscarriage, and it was it was hellish to get through, hellish to go through, hellish to get through. Absolutely, uh, I lied. I had said that I didn't have kind of questions. I just remember this morning, That's or cool, last night, that I, I had Got some questions. So, for that experience, that part of your experience, mm-hmm. what were things you felt you needed that you didn't get? Oh goodness! Support number one. I needed support. I needed. Um, I needed to go to counseling. I did not. Mm. Um, I needed family support. I didn't have it. Um, I needed a partner support. The person who I made this child with mm. was not a support. Okay. Um, didn't grieve with me. Um, I, I won't say he didn't grieve on his own. I won't say that of him, but he didn't grieve with me. It wasn't a collective grief. Mm. Um, and I need. I needed somebody to just say, are you okay? I kind of just went on with life. And I wasn't okay. I was suicidal. I was depressed. Mm. I was in a very dark space. I wasn't happy. A lot of hormones and stuff. Yeah. Too, like, right? And people probably didn't tell you about that part. Didn't no, Nobody, there was no aftercare. There was no after checkup. Um, I don't even think I went to a regular OBGYN after the miscarriage. I literally just went on with life. Went on to work. Mm. Went on, on trips. Went traveling. We actually had a... Me and my homegirls for quite some time went to Cancun every May. And so we had a trip planned that May, two weeks before my miscarriage. So I miscarried on the 5th and we were leaving actually on my birthday, the 22nd. So three weeks. And I went. I went to Mexico because when I paid all my money to go to Mexico. And it was kind of like, put that little piece of your hurt in a box and then just be okay for your girls. Be okay for this trip. Be okay for this situation. You don't want to destroy anybody else's vacation. You don't want to destroy anybody else's time. So your misery, you'll put it in a box. You'll deal with that when you're by yourself. And so it was an incredibly lonely. Testimony of so many of us. Oh yeah, suffering in darkness, Mm. suffering in the shadows, suffering in the closet, suffering behind closed doors, crying on your pillow. My pillow is my best friend because it knows all my tears. All of it. But you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to. 
Right. You know, I have too many women in my circle. I have too many mothers exactly. in my circle. I have too many sisters in my circle to have to have gone through that and felt alone. And and not to say that there weren't people in my village that, you know, came around me and, and offered themselves to me. I won't say that, that that everybody was just like, oh, well, Ayanna had a miscarriage. Let's get over it. That, that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but I felt very alone, uh, very depressed, suicidal, um, blamed God, resentful at God. And then for a long time, like, what's my what's wrong with me? Beating myself up. I can't give this man it, that whole yeah, societal like woman, right? And, I can't give this man a child. He wants a child. I can't do what a woman is supposed to do. And and it was it was very very difficult to dig myself out of that hole and out of that space. It was very hard. Woo, child. I know, right? <laughs> heavy. Let me lot. take a sip. Let me take. It a is. Sip. It's heavy, but I think it's necessary. Like we have to talk about this because I'm certain there's gonna be people who hear this. It could be men and women. Right, because men are also part of um, a fertility journey too. Right? Absolutely, and so they can have partners who they are trying to create life with, and, right? And it and, be a struggle, and it be a struggle whether with themselves or right. with their partner, right? And not knowing, maybe that um, maybe he doesn't know what to say to his partner. Mm-hmm. Maybe he doesn't know how she's feeling because she doesn't want to talk about it, right? But I think to hear this, to know. One, what someone who's experienced is feeling is it's. I think it's a, it, it might be even a, a great way to start a conversation. Be like, hey, I heard this podcast. Right, babe. I heard this Let's lady talk say about this. this. Right. Is this how you felt? Or, um, you know, I don't want you to feel like this. So tell me what it is that I can do right. to be supportive. And as women, just being there for each other instead of saying, oh, you had a miscarriage. All right, girl. All right. Well, you know. Right. Like, you don't want to touch you. that. Right. Um, okay. And then, no. Right. Like, talk about it. Feel it. Feel through it. Right. right? And then so for me, I've started my fertility journey again. I'm talking about that during this season of the podcast. And for me, it's been, you talked about uh, the part of it being lonely and sad, mm-hmm. right? Well, I ain't got a partner right now. So that's, I think that's yeah, me part neither, of it. It's all right, me though. It's all right. I'm they good. coming. They coming. Okay. Can we we talk see about- you, soulmate. Okay. We see you. So I see I see you. <laughs> I'm ready. Um, <laughs> but the, I think the loneliness piece of it. Or sadness for me that came about mm-hmm. is having to navigate it by myself. Yeah, alone. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. I not get it. even if I it's not it. with the partner piece, but just me feeling like I couldn't tell a particular like saying, "Hey, I'm about to go do this." That couldn't come with me. Right. You know what I mean? Like that's the part that kind of made me sad. And of course, there is that piece of like you know. Uh, this would have been nice to have, even though it's COVID time. So your partner couldn't come to the office with right, you right, anyway. Right. But stay right there. Stay. I'll wait, right. wait for you. Wait in the car. car. Wait in right. the car. Just boo. knowing that Moral person support. is there. Yeah. But in all honesty, the people that I have been with, that I, let me rephrase that. People I've been with that I wanted to have children mm-hmm. because I Girl, not everybody. everybody. Right. Uh, Use discernment. Use which, discernment. <laughs> which even still, it's not gonna make any better when I say what I'm gonna say next. I probably would not have felt supported with them. Mm. That's key. And That's key. That's that would have made me feel even sadder. So, right. like, that to me was like, you know what? I, it, maybe it is better I go through this by myself. I can build whatever. Not strength, because I don't always want to be strong. Fuck that. Mm. Not necessarily build the strength, but just to kind of go through this journey and be able to be vulnerable with myself in gotcha. this way. And maybe it's, it's it's a good thing. And I and I don't I don't question what happens in my life and how it happens anymore. It's like, all right, this is what it's supposed to be, got it. You know? But I think this journey was supposed to help build me in a way. Yeah. Because I spent so much time. I only thought about my fertility though when I was with somebody. Attached to a partner. Correct. Yeah. It's the first time in my That's life something that, that I'm taking the key steps to think about my fertility my Yeah, because it's yours. Right. That was something that I had to do, too, because I used to say it all the time. I used to, you know, you got the aunties, you got the mamas, mm-hmm. the god mamas, the, the elders. Mm-hmm. When you going to have a kid, I would hear it all the time. Ayana, you got all your other stuff together. You got your degrees. You got your place. Okay. When are you having a kid? And I'd be like, my go-to default answer would be like, well, I need to find a man. I need to find a man. I need to find a partner first. <laughs> these, these niggas out, you know, excuse right. me. You know, I, that would be my answer. And then one day I had to sit with myself and say, why do I attach my motherhood to a man? That divine blessing of motherhood is mine and mine alone to own. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and and take it into my hands and take it into control for me to for me to create co-create with God. Like yes, you need sperm to have a baby somewhere along the line. There needs to be some sperm happening with an egg. That's just how babies are made. I understand that. So I don't want to remove a man from the process. I understand that there needs to be a yin and a yang mm-hmm. in the process. However, taking ownership of my motherhood is mine and mine alone to sit in. Um, and when I align with the person I'm supposed to align with and we're supposed to have children, yeah. it's going to be out of my control anyway. I'm not going to be able to dictate when it happens and how it happens. It's going to happen regardless of whether I'm ready or not. But readying myself for parenthood and for motherhood, it was a self-act because... Yeah. I realized that what I was wanting back in the day when I was with my my last partner, I wanted to, you know, I was I was stupid. I had stupid girl syndrome. That's what I call it. SGS. Stupid girl syndrome. Girl, I had it too. So right. It's okay. Stupid girl syndrome. You Ooh. know, I'm gonna coin that. I'm gonna trademark that. But SGS, stupid girl syndrome, and stupid guy syndrome because guys can have it too, <laughs> is where you want to fill the space with something to make it mm. what it isn't. Ooh. And I was like, if I make him a father again, uh. then uh, this is this will be a forever thing. He'll wake up. He'll grow up. He'll get it together. We'll get it together. You gain some type of and hell no, I would have just had a headache of a baby father. That's what I would have had. You know, I would have had a beautiful okay. child out of it, but a headache a headache of a baby father. Okay. And it <laughs> wasn't time. And every time that God has spared me. Hmm. From my own free will, because it was a blessing in disguise. My, my my miscarriage in that situation was a blessing in disguise. I know it now. I didn't feel it then. Mm-hmm. But every time God says no to something, he He knows your ass ain't ready. Yeah. This ain't what you need to be doing. Okay. And I blamed God for so long. I would see, you know, I, I was happy for the people in my life who were having children. I was happy for my friends and family who were who were extending their family, but there was always that resentment. Yeah, girl. Every baby shower I went to, every baby shower I, I my my it's best friend, yeah. my um, my god baby is six. She just had a birthday a, a couple of weeks ago, like last week, two weeks ago, almost. And helped plan the baby shower when my best friend was pregnant. Was there rubbing? The, we was. I did the process where I went to the hospital with her when she found out the sex. It was me. My best friend and her husband, we were, the three of us were there, did the baby shower, was there when the baby, I didn't, I wasn't there when the baby came out, but I was there the, the next morning and held the baby and, I, and it was joy that we had this yeah. new life, but there was always that residual resentment, not resentment at my friend and resentment at my God baby, but resentment at God, like, where's mine? Yeah. When's my time? Yeah. And I realized, like, God was like, you fool, I'm trying to protect you, girl. Okay. You asking for a whole world of trouble. And I'm trying to spare your dumb ass. That's how my God talk. I don't know about your God, but my God be cussing <laughs> at me. Even though I'm trying to spare you and you asking for something that you just don't need right now. Mm. Let me Wait on me because I'll blow your mind. And so when I got to that point in that realization, I stopped yearning for it in the same way. Do I yearn to be a mother? Yes. Do I want to be a mother? Yes. Do I want to biologically have children? Yes. Mm. But the yearning is different. Yeah. Now I'm waiting on God. I'm like, God, ready me. Yes. I'm, if I'm not ready yet, ready me. What do I need to do to yeah. be ready? And that's outside of a partner. Like when the partner comes, we it's on the yeah. pocket. I know okay. what to do after that point. Yeah. When he get here, <laughs> I know what to do <laughs> after that point. I know how to make a baby. I know how to do that. Okay. But before then, am I ready? Am I emotionally ready? Am I mentally ready? Um, I used to say things like, if I get pregnant again, I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm not going to mm. let anybody know. And that was that was residual trauma from having a miscarriage, and from the the very li- few people that knew about my pregnancy then, feeling like I let them down because I had a miscarriage. So I was like, I'm not gonna tell nobody wow. I'm pregnant. I'm not gonna tell nobody I'm pregnant. Wow. I'm gonna just hide the pregnancy. Like, that's like victim blaming, right? You, but that's what that's. Listen, and I know that there are women out here whose testimony is that that you're so afraid wow. you've lost a child before. That you can't really revel in the joy of motherhood because you're scared. You're scared it's going to happen again. You're afraid you're going to lose this one. And now I'm not going to tell nobody till till I get past this point. And then I'll make it past that point. I've known women who have gone to eight months and, and had a stillborn or lost yes. their baby. 
Yep. And so pregnancy is a very scary, scary, risky time. Period. For people who have healthy babies and healthy pregnancies, it is a nerve wracking yeah. time. Yeah. But for women who have struggled with fertility, it is it's it's that and then some. Because you always feel like you don't have enough and you always feel like it's you. And I went to get fertility testing with my ex um, after the miscarriage, like a year or two after that. I was like, we'll try again, but this time we'll, we'll go and we'll get tested. I went. They looked at the egg follicle. They looked all up and through. It was a very invasive process. I'm there, child. It's oof. And <laughs> I got back clean bill of health. Yeah. They were like, your reproduction organs are good. Your eggs is there. You that popping, was, sis. That was God. You straight. That was God. And I was like, oh, okay, but wait. Men, this is a message for men. Do not think that you cannot have fertility issues. Can we? I'm going to lean in. Okay. I'm going to talk to my <laughs> brothers right now. Talk okay. to my brothers right now because I had a partner who had a child. He had about a his child was um, around eight around that time, That's seven or eight. To that, but yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and his lifestyle was not the healthiest. Mm-hmm. Smoked. I smoked. Um, we didn't eat the healthiest. He drank. He, you know, drug use. Um, cigarette smoke. And he was, he's, he's a little bit older than me. He's four years older than me. So if I'm, if I was like 25 at the time, he was around 29, okay. almost 30. Mm-hmm. And I went, got my fertility test, got the whole workup. And it was a clean bill. You His look good. Was, I already had a baby, right? So I'm right. Good. He wouldn't get tested. <laughs> I already have a kid. I got a kid. I know I can have a kid. Mm-hmm. Look, I got proof. I got walking, living, breathing proof that I can have a kid. So it can't be me. And I was like. So then you're blaming me. Correct. So then I'm the problem. Correct. Because it takes two people. To have a It child. takes an egg and the sperm to make a healthy baby. And so I got my eggs tested. I got my eggs cracked and scrambled and looked through. <laughs> and he would not go and, and do the sperm test. He would not go and do the test. And it was his pride. It was his pride and his ego. Because yeah. how dare it be me? How dare I have the fertility issue? And that is a problem. That's mm. a problem infertility that the men don't think it could be them and nobody's an issue nobody's the problem it's you guys are having difficulty creating life the natural way yes and yes. there are things that can happen with so medicine yeah. that can support you yeah. but you got to move your ego and your pride out the way brothers get tested Auntie. put the sperm in the cup get tested figure it out and I'm- it might be you and I'm not even, to add on to that, I'm not even going to lie to you, even though I've never taken a step to do fertility testing, because I ain't going to lie, I was afraid, right? I dealt with people, and there was one partner in particular who had child, children mm-hmm. or children already. And me thinking, we were together for quite some time, four plus years, and I'm thinking, I ain't getting pregnant now. Right. One time, this must, it must be me. Right. Like, something must be going on with me. And recently and that was just a mindset right mm-hmm. like oh if the person already has a child it can't be that can't clearly be that. they did it at true. some point it's and true. it's not true and i recently i've been listening to this podcast um called you had me at black but mm-hmm. then they have this combo that they doing with this other podcast i think called natal okay and so it's strictly about um black family black stories about nice. um nice. creating life and pregnancy and the things we endure and go through and i learned on that episode they had doctors they have doctors and stuff come on saying that it is a myth to think that just because that you've had children before that you can't be infertile now right and they said that depending for males and females depending on how much time has lapsed depending on your lifestyle depending on genetic there's so many things that go right right, that you could have been fertile at that point but now you are not as fertile as you were before that the viability of your sperm the the health of your egg thing whatever activity all that lifestyle and i was just like right i knew this in my spirit when i was with this person but how could i prove you internalized i internalized it thinking it was me because oh this person had a child before and i've never gotten actually had you know had a a a, a, a confirmed pregnancy i'm gonna say a confirmed pregnancy so i was thinking yeah it it was me but after i heard it i was just like oh my gosh and honestly i i this morning actually reviewed my reproductive testing um Mm -hmm. you know everything's electronic now and everything is 
normal, normal, See? normal, normal. See? So it wasn't me. Now, I do, like I said, I believe in God. Okay, ain't nobody tell me nothing different. Amen. And I understand the power of spirit, and I yes, believe Lord. in protection. Yes, God. I was being protected. All the time. It was not through supposed to happen when never <laughs> one of blocked it. <laughs> the spiritual gods and ancestors was like, we block it, we bind it, we throw it away. Yeah, it's not supposed to happen. one of them. Yeah. Okay, especially this particular one. I, All my exes tried to get me so pregnant, much. Yeah. All, all of them. All of them. All of them. And in this, this especially this particular case, my body was rejecting, rejecting him in every single way. Oh, so no, you're I'm, right. I'm, yeah. This is no lie. I literally, a lot of people probably haven't heard of this, probably don't even think about it or don't think it's a real thing. I literally was allergic to his semen. Oh, yeah. It's I, real. I actually had to go to, like, I had Dudes to go to can throw off that pH. I was, like, quote, unquote, studied. Like, it was, like, a real thing. Mm. It's not pH. I was allergic my coat, my throat would start to get itchy. Stop. I would get sweat. Like, it was. And she was still, four years? You see how long it took for you? Girl, bye. What, what, what was the that term? S, was it SGS? SGS, girl. Stupid, stupid girl, girl syndrome. syndrome. Okay. Child. And so this particular, like, my body was completely rejecting this person. Wow. And you through wanted, and, and this you is the wanted, one I really cra- wanted You to craved have to have his baby. You craved. Ooh, now so imagine, imagine if God me. didn't block it. Imagine what you would have been going through. That's what I say to Every myself. Day, I'd be like, "Thank you so much." Yeah, because I'm telling you, I had, I had exes like, Woo. like asking me, like, "Are you do, like, are you doing something behind my back? Are you taking birth control behind my back? Like, like actively trying to get me knocked up?" And I was like, "Nah, like I'm, I'm catching this. You shooting up the club? It just ain't happening." But nah and it was god god blocked it god protects babies and fools and i damn sure ain't no baby so i must I have was been there a i was a fool okay <laughs> it's the truth That's but but fact. yes it's 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 literally it's a it's a miracle it's a gift it's science all wrapped into one and i think people i think media and i think society has us to believe that you lay down with somebody and boom boom and it's actually very difficult. And it, the podcast I would listen to, I've listened to several, but the podcast I would listen to said, it's actually very hard to get pregnant. It's a window. It's an ovulation window. It's a very yeah. three to five days in the month, gotta honey. Right. The, the, the sperm, the, 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 sperm the, gotta the, the heat, right. the, 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 the vagina gotta be right. right. Like everything. Your is, discharge has to be a certain di- child. We're gonna get the science behind making a baby. You know, so people think that it is just lay down with somebody and you get pregnant and that's that's just not it thank goodness and and god bless those who have the ability to to quickly and successfully uh conceive children thank god for that because it is not as easy as you think and it's a struggle but the thing is we don't have these conversations and and it's it's generational i did not know until my miscarriage that my mother, um, before she got pregnant with me, and my mother had me at 41. So my mother, I was the baby. I'm the last mm. child. I was the, I was the, ooh, you did it again, child. Um, I she was had, that for my mom, too, but she had right. me at 33. So can you imagine? Right. 41. At 33, 33. they thought that, ooh, you I'm at 33 child. now. You old at 33. Thank you. So y'all imagine a great mother right. giving me. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. So Anne had me very late. My father was 52. My mother was th- uh, 41. And... Before she had me, before she conceived me, she was already pregnant. Eight months pregnant and had lost oh, the child. Never knew that. Never, wow. never knew that. Never heard it. Never talked about it. My mother has never shared that with me. And I am I was sitting in my womanhood, wow. experiencing my loss. And uh, the way I found out and the way my mother told me wasn't like, a, oh, honey, sit with me. Let me talk to you because I done been there. It was like, girl, you be all right. Get over it because it is what it is. That that was my mother's pep talk to her child. And and wow. then she told me what she had experienced. Didn't go into detail, but told me, yeah, girl, I lost a baby at eight months. And then I had you. It'll be fine. You'll be fine. And then just moved on. And wow. that trauma, the trauma of not being cradled by your mother. Yeah, that's what you needed to do. That. Right. And held in your womanhood. Had me be. I was resentful. I was angry. I was sour. Um, I was, you know, distraught because I was like, nobody's holding me in this pain, and I feel like I gotta hold it myself, and I didn't want to hold it. I felt mm. like it was unfair that I had to hold all of this hurt and all yeah. of this pain uh, by myself. And um, you know, you had, I had to lean on God because that was it. That was all I had in the moment. Wow. Yeah, it's real. honestly, when I had my pregnancy scare, which again, I didn't, many people didn't know about, 
and honestly speaking to the, the, the reproductive endocrinologist that first time I met with her she was like oh that probably was a chemical pregnancy but I was at the time I was I was young I was like 19 20 but I was super I was about 19 I was super so afraid that should have been a moment though you should be able to go to and right. talk to your mother or right. somebody but I was so afraid and I literally internalized it and even afterwards even though I never I was too afraid to go get a test to confirm it mm-hmm. but I know what was happening to my body didn't feel right right like, it was different than what I've ever experienced I've been having my cycle for years and this didn't feel regular mm-hmm. you know but I was just too scared and it's 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 sad to 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 be in that space and feel like the women that you're supposed to lean on that has the knowledge that has the experience that you cannot go to and I know growing up I knew my mother she had lost two children Mm -hmm. I never heard my mother talk about that Mm. she's never talked about it Mm. and one was she was she birthed and had for I think a year and a half or so and then lost that child Mm. and one she she lost while she was pregnant so it's like why is it that we don't talk about like why we have it now but I'm going I'm a presser. I ain't gonna lie. Yeah, I'm that's the responsibility. Cause... Deeper than it's a responsibility. Yeah. Like, and I, if there are any um, elders listening to this, older grandmothers, yeah. aunties, older women that are listening to this, it is the responsibility. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm nobody's grandmother right now. I'm somebody's aunt. I have a, a uh-huh. an 18 year old niece. I have a 25 year old niece. If and when they are ready to have a conversation, I'm going to tell them the real because it's my responsibility space for right it's my we done been there i don't walk through that door i don't walk through that path i've experienced it i don't want them to feel alone it's my responsibility to wrap my hands around them mm-hmm. and to give them what i have experienced and it's and i and i looked towards um some elders and i was like we all at we all at yeah. you know and it felt a, like a very lonely place to be and even now not being able to i'm my I'm assuming, again, making assumptions because I haven't had a conversation, but assuming that my mother didn't have any fertility issues, but even feel, I don't feel like I can go to her and be like, oh, mom, hey, I did right. this testing, I did this. I feel like her response is going to be, why do you need to do that Right. Boy? You just need to find a man, man and, and have a baby. And it's like, oh, sis, oh, no, it's not that. exactly how it works. Stop <laughs> like, that, right, stop and, that. And it's not even, but also I don't think she would understand the fact that this is preventive or just to like, precautionary right because in all honesty i don't i don't know if i have an issue but i've been f- made to feel like i was the one that mm-hmm. had an issue like you were the problem because society made you feel like that partners exactly. made you feel like that right when in actuality it's like i could be perfectly fine and divine intervention just was like nah not That's this it. one not that one and we not see it happen one. all the time we see women all the time we see women when a man 10 years ain't got no kids she meet a dude all, and then six boom, months boom, later boom. she break big belly pregnant you know it happens all the time I know people that have, have happened to me too. So, um, but society so makes true. us believe that's that it's true. you. You're not the problem. You're not the problem. And and even if you do have fertility issues, you are not the problem. Right. Bodies work differently. Different. You know, and some people need support to make things happen. Some people need Correct. interventions to make things Correct. happen. That does not make you less of a woman. Okay. It does or not make you less of a man. Mm. It does not make you less of a person. It does not make you less of a parent. Like it just you just need a different level of support. That's it. We have to we have to take the taboo-ness out of making a baby. Exactly. And it's a big business. They that exactly. guilt, they sell you on that guilt because making a baby is a big business. We're gonna talk about that. It is though. It's it's dollars and cents. Yeah. So the medical field makes you feel guilty, makes exactly. you feel all these things because it's a big business behind And it. think about it. I mean, it's the same, you know. Uh, comparison that we we sometimes take with like mental health and your physical health yeah. right if you have a broken bone you go to the doctor right. you get it fixed right no one's telling you oh suck it up right get so over when it, it get over it when it's when it's your mental health it depending on what it is depression right. or whatever they tell you oh just pray oh, it anxiety out. it's okay right you'll be fine and it's the same thing i think for me when you're thinking about your reproductive health like let's say you have a physical condition or a, a medical condition, right? Let's say it could be, you know, you're diabetic or whatever the case right. is. No one's like, oh, you're less than a person because right. you ain't got insulin or you can't make insulin. No one's, no right. one's doing that. So why would why, are why we being we made to feel that, oh, if, you're, if your reproductive system doesn't work, how quote unquote everyone else does. And again, everyone else don't work the same. Mm-hmm. But you're made to feel like it does that you're less of because yeah. of it. Stop policing women's vaginas. Oh, my God. All right. Can I just... That's a PSA. Stop policing. Stop telling Stop women what to my do. uterus. With their uterus. You want to... Listen. Uh. 
You want to have an abortion, have an abortion that's your uterus. You want to never have a child, never have a child because that's your business. You want to have five children and be on public assistance. That's also your business. Stop telling women what to do with their bodies. It's not your vagina, not your choice. Never your choice. What a woman wants to do with her own reproductive organs. That's that's my soapbox. My soapbox. Can I just add, tack tack on to that? Women don't have kids by themselves. So let's just hello. So why are we policing the woman? Police the penis. Okay. Hello. Tell well, them that, to keep their uh, penis just, in their pants. Tell them know, wrap it up. Let's, let's move right. Let's just... Not boys will be boys, and women need to be saints. It that day is over. That day is done. But yeah, it's real. We got to have these conversations in, in in our in our community. We have to because because um, black family and and black parenthood mm. is sacred. There is, there's say we we are sacred people. We are spiritual people, and it is sacred when you when man woman, when mm-hmm. person and person create a child. That's sacred. That's a yeah. blessed act that they have for so long tried to bastardize, tried to prevent, yeah. tried to um, extinguish, and so we have got to protect our rights. To have children and to create black families, like I like, I know I'm going a little deeper, but it really is insidious on how they attack the black family and mm-hmm. how they make us believe that we just don't have the ability to create life when we do. Um, and so we got to take that back into our own hands, and we have to protect that. The community has to protect it at all costs. Absolutely, brothers, you got to protect the women you dropping your seed in. Like, mm. like I don't understand. I, it, for the life of me, I don't understand how. A woman can be carrying a child and go through hell in the nine months. That time is sacred. From the minute she pee on a stick and find out she pregnant to the minute she had wow. that child. She is it's forming life. A person, a whole, a All life. these veins and bones you got in your body, your it's mama formed that. that. She made it. She formed it in her womb. That's why, why would you put somebody through un, undeserving stress during that time? If you can't do right by her, leave her ass completely alone. But don't F with her. When she's creating life. And that is a sacred time. And that new life is absorbing all that energy. All that energy. So every headache you give her while she's pregnant, every 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 effed up thing that happened, like, come on. Like, come on. That's fertile ground. That's sacred ground. Yep. That life is forming in. We got to do better. We got to do better. As a community, we got to do better with that. But, yeah, nah. Like, we, start, we have to have, start to have these conversations with each other. Women have to talk about it. I have... I have a group of friends. None of us have children. We are all in our mid thirties. Some mm-hmm. of us, late thirties. Yep. None of us have children. Yep, None of us sit around and have any conversations about fertility issues. We may one on one have a sister girl conversation when we're feeling safe enough to be vulnerable one on one. But as a collective, ain't none of us like, hey. "What's up, sis? Are you good?" Are you good? Yeah. Let me pray over your womb. Let me pray over your so that you're fruitful and you can multiply. You know what I'm saying? We've got to break that. We've got to break that silence because that silence is killing us. That's, that's, whew, girl, you, that's a word. I don't even got nothing else to add. That's a word. So moving on to, I know there's another part of your journey. Yes. That you are exploring. And so um, I know we've mentioned, we've talked about it, and you've mentioned that you are looking into adoption as Damn. a form of, of um, getting that motherhood that you are, Damn. that you know that you are destined for. So yes. please talk about that because I don't know much about the process. Like I've, you know, I've heard. Usually when I hear about adoption, is like, matter of fact, you don't even hear somebody mention it. You just baby shows I adopted, up. Right. I adopted a child. You're like, oh, right. okay, <laughs> you know. Right. So please talk about that that journey Thank and that you. process. I'm is. excited. I'm looking for a baby, y'all. I I I am. I prayed on it. It it hit me like you know when spirit talks to you, spirit just talks to you okay. sometimes. And so it just kept coming up. I kept hearing, you should adopt. And I've always been open to considering adoption. I think it's a beautiful gift to be able to uh, have a child and give a child a home and, and, and give a child just love because you choose to. Um, and so I've always been open to adoption. And then it just kept coming up more and more. It came up in my dream. It came up when I was awake and daydreaming. And so, you know, I'm a person who believes in spiritual uh, confirmation. So I got a couple of readings on it. And the readings were like, yeah, yeah, no, adopt and do it, and do it now. Um, not don't wait, do it now. And that was, that was the message that I got from uh, God and from my ancestors. And so I just made it in my mind that I'm going to adopt a child. 
I'm a single woman. I don't have a partner in it right now, but a partner is coming. I feel it. Where you at, boo? Hey, boo. Um, I know you just you. you he might me. be watching. You watch it. I love you. I love that you. Relationship you in? You should leave her. You know you don't like her. She you can't know in your spirit it ain't working. It she ain't don't have work. no what? I'm sorry. No, like, <laughs> leave her ass and come find your forever boo. Um, sidebar. But yes. Yeah, so you know, I'm a single woman, and I was like, I'm gonna adopt. So I started to do my research because that's where you got to start. You got to start with research. And I had no idea about adoption. Nobody, I don't know anybody in my immediate family who is adopted. Um, I don't, I, you know, you know, unless they tell you that they're adopted, I don't yeah. really know people who are adopted or who went through the process. So I was starting from scratch. So I went, called several agencies and did some phone interviews, phone screenings, filled out some applications and just Google was my best friend. And I realized that adoption is a big business, huh. like everything else in America. So you can literally buy a baby for about 50 grand, because that's what I've been quoted, from about four or five agencies, between 45000 and $55,000 for their entire service. And that is from start to finish. Um, the process looks similar with all agencies. You have to do a home study. It's the first step. They come, they check you out, they do a series of interviews, they check out your home, see how you're living. Uh, they might interview some of your loved ones, ask you all about your business, get all up in your business because they want to know that you're not crazy because you want somebody's child. Um, and then after you do a home study, you kind of make like a, I would call it like a dating profile, like a profile that you put online mm. for birth mothers to find you to okay. say, yeah, this looks like the person I want to give my baby to. Then once there's a match, God willing, a, ba a birth mother wants to give you their child and you want to receive the child. Then you go through the placement process where you get you actually get the baby. The baby is placed with you, but you it's not your child yet. Um, and you go through the placement process. You go to court. It's all legal. Legalities to it. You have right. to go to court. Do all of that. Um, the birth parents sign over their rights. And then depending on the state, it's between 30 and 45 days of waiting. Um, to say that give, giving the, the, the birth parents a grace period to say I changed my mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If they change their mind within those 30 days, they can take their child back and the adoption falls through. That's hard and all of your money falls through with okay. it. You don't get your money back. <laughs> you don't get that 50 grand back. Um, and so that's, that's the traditional adoption agency route. If I were to go with an agency... That's the option. Uh, that's the adoption agency route. Then there are adoption attorneys, where say I knew somebody who had a child and they wanted to give me their child. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to go through an agency. I'd go directly to an adoption attorney to handle all the legality and all the paperwork that I had to go to the court, and I'd do it that way. Um, things that are non-existent existent in America now are like orphans, orphanage. Orphanages. Uh -huh. They don't have that anymore. It's social mm -hmm. service now, so mm -hmm. it's foster care. If a child is abandoned, if a child is orphaned, mm -hmm. um, they go directly into foster care. And so foster care is another option, and it's the most affordable. Actually, you don't pay in foster care. They pay it's you. It's a longer process. It's a so longer I, process. Yeah. It's a little bit more heartbreaking. Yeah. Most of those children have a lot more trauma and issue, medical issue, trauma. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you don't, you're not usually guaranteed a baby. And I want out-the-womb infant. That's my preference. Mm -hmm. I want a baby. Um, so I'm considering foster care. I actually have a meeting on Thursday with the foster care agency, okay. um, an introductory orientation meeting. So foster care is on the table, um, but I'm I'm still in my research phase. I haven't solidified an agency that I want to go with. I don't have forty six to fifty grand sitting around. Okay. Um, and I received through prayer and through readings and through confirmation that I won't have to spend $50,000 for a baby. That there is a child that is waiting for me that is mine and that will come to me uh -huh. in need uh -huh. and I will be in the position to receive that child. So right now I'm waiting. It's a waiting game. I'm doing my research. I'm looking even considering into international and there are a whole lot of legalities and stuff yeah. for that. Yeah. Um, but... I'm opening my heart and my mind um, and manifesting and, and setting intentions for having this baby come to me through adoption. I shared it in my network. I shared it with you. I shared it with friends and family. Mm -hmm. And there was a reason for that. 
um, because people know people. Who know people? Who know people? Mm-hmm. Who know people? And so I'm yeah. saying it on this podcast right now. You might not know me, but I'm a great person and I'll be a great mama. She is. If you <laughs> know somebody who is considering giving their child up for adoption, right. consider Ayana. And uh, T will tag Contact all my information. Yes, right. Yes, yes. Consider me. I'm looking for a baby. And so if somebody is struggling with what they want to do and, and making a decision that they want to give their child up because that's the best decision for them, uh-huh. consider me. And and sometimes that's the way you'll you'll find your baby. So I'm putting it in God's hands and I know that eventually I'll have a beautiful baby to, to welcome into my heart and into my home. And, and and I choose this path because this is just what God has placed on my heart. I'm, I'm being obedient. I heard it. I received it. I got a reading on it. It was confirmed. Mm-hmm. So I'm just being obedient to what God has decided that this is what I should be doing right now. And that's where I'm at. From your lips to God's ears. There we okay. go. Come on, baby. Uh, your mama's tr- waiting I'm on you. I'm trusting it. And, there's, and, and I think that's the part of... I think this is a part of the journey Mm -hmm. that people don't often think about or consider in a real way, right? Because I love what you said earlier that we, your your divine wanting, yearning, or right to motherhood Mm -hmm. is a separate entity, right? Right. And this is why that part is not necessarily connected to To a a partner partner and a mate. Yes. Or to a mate. So there's motherhood, there's parenthood, right? There's, and there's, before motherhood, there's your own personal fertility and and reproductive health, right? And I think that we all kind of, and and pregnancy, and I think we all kind of just mingle and gel it together. And they're not the same Mm -hmm. things. And I think, I think that this is why I wanted to talk to you because I feel like you're really clear about um, your journey, your path, and and distinguishing what is and what isn't. So yeah, it I just got to that point very recently of understanding that um, my fertility and my path to motherhood was not inter intertwined with me being a partner and being a a wife or being someone's woman like i can have one or the other or i can have both and i will eventually i'll have both but i don't have to wait for one in order to pursue another and so i'm readying myself for motherhood and i'm readying myself to be a parent outside of being someone's woman i know both are going to come and it's going to be in God's time. And if God decides that the man comes before the baby comes, thank you, God. If God decides that the baby comes before the man comes, thank you, God, there, too. Um, but it's not, you don't have to have one one before the other. It's not the horse before the cart type of thing. Right. And I just recently, literally, like, it maybe in the past year or so, got to that place of understanding. Because I, I was there. I was there like, well, I ain't got no man to have no baby with, so stop asking me when I'm going to have a baby. Mm-hmm. When I find me a man that's worth it me having a baby with and I have a baby and I used to say that and and it would feel ridiculous that I would say it but I would say it because that's what I was conditioned to say Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like that's what society made me believe first comes love then comes marriage then comes you with the baby carriage like those are nursery rhymes but those are that's conditioning we condition little girls and little boys to think that that's the way that it has to be done right right, and who said that you can't take an active step in becoming a parent and do it for yourself like if I wanted to go to the sperm bank and just get somebody's sperm and have a baby, that's my right. That's my my, my vagina, my right. right. That's my choice. If I want to adopt, that's also my right and my choice. If I want to do surrogate, surrogate, that's also my right and my mm-hmm, choice. Mm-hmm. Whatever you choose for your path is, is between you and God. That's the contract you're making with God. And you don't owe any explanation to anybody. So at all. I'm going to be a mama regardless of whether or not I got a man to do it with. That's it. That's right. And I, I pray, I'm continue, I'm going to continue to send my prayers. Thank you so much. For you to Thank accomplish you. that. I receive it. So, to end off the episode, what do you feel throughout your whole journey? Um, what do you wish you knew? Um, I wish I knew um, then. What I know now is that it wasn't my fault. Mm. And that um, nothing is wrong with you. Mm. Um, I wish that I had that that assurity. I wish that I had that resounding understanding that nothing is wrong with you, yeah. and that it's not your fault. Um, I know that now. I didn't know that then, and so I took a lot of emotional beating on mm. my down on myself and and pain um, because I didn't know that and I didn't understand that it's not your fault. 
And so I wish then that the 25 year old in me understood that and and then had somebody to remind me of that when I had lost sight of that. Um, but, you know, God reminded me. God lifted me up, picked me up, dusted me off and was like, you know, you ain't got to cry no more. So Okay, let's talk about it. I'm glad. I'm glad I, and I thank God. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to, you said it right there. Just, just now, I guess I'm in a different stage of my journey, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do echo what you said of like that feeling of something's wrong with me, mm-hmm. right? And it's there's nothing wrong with me, right? This is just me. I am right. uniquely myself, and this is what my story is. And um, and I think that's what I would share with others is that don't think anything is wrong with you, right. and but also know you have the power to answer those questions you have lingering in your head absolutely that was also the thing for me. I had all these questions, but I was also too afraid, and I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. Go and find out. There's right. power in knowledge. That's it. That's and once it. you got it, you can navigate the rest of your life how you want it. That's it. And timing is key. There's another. There's. I have this. I wrote this quote on my arm. I have this as a tattoo. It was a Facebook. I, I got this off of Facebook. <laughs> um, there was a like a parable of a dog and a and a hmm. and an elephant, and the dog had had a, a litter of puppies, and the elephant was pregnant. And if you know anything uh, about the elephant, hmm. the elephant is pregnant for two years. God bless elephant. <laughs> um, and the dog had had their litter and was like, oh, you still pregnant? I had another litter. And I had another litter. So the dog had had about three sets of puppies by the, and the, and the elephant was still pregnant with their one mm-hmm. child. And the dog was like, well, what's wrong with you? Like, I'm out here pushing these puppies out and you just dragging your feet. And the elephant said, you know, when you give birth, you give birth and you add what you add into the world. But when I give birth, I, like... I'm, I'm creating something that you're not creating here. Mm. I'm creating a level of greatness in my womb that you're not creating. Basically, like anybody, any dog can have a puppy, but a, pup, uh, but a dog can't make an elephant. And this is what it takes mm. to make an elephant. It takes time. I have to wait. This is my calling, and I have to sit in this. And there was a quote at the end of it, and, and I have it as a tat. It's on my arm. And it says, My time is coming, and when it hits the surface of the earth, people shall yield in admiration. And I have this on my arm as a reminder that everything is in due timing. Mm -hmm. Everything is in divine timing. And when I have that baby, Lord, like, listen, the floodgates going to open. The the, the sun going to shine differently. The birds going to chirp. The trees going to rumble. Oh, yes. My child's going to come here and shake up the world some way, somehow. I know I'm creating greatness. And so creating greatness takes time. Yes. And 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 I I want to leave y'all with that. Everything is in divine timing. You can't do God's job. Stop trying to do God's job by worrying mm-hmm. about it. Stop trying to do God's job by imposing your free will and just let him work. And he will blow your mind every single time. That's it. That's and my with, piece. And with that, thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, boo. Thank you for having me. Thank you. For today's Connection Corner, I'll leave you all with one of the hardest parts of life is deciding whether to walk away or try harder. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of the Oasis podcast. I hope you were able to find something that resonated with you on your journey. Don't forget to subscribe, share this episode, and like us on Instagram at the Oasis podcast. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us on Instagram or email us at ajsoasis at gmail.com. Again, that's A-A-Y-J-A-Y-S-O-A-S-I-S at gmail.com.